HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman, hosted by Carl Franklin. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 163, recorded live Tuesday, May 26, 2009. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik RAD Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET Web applications. Online at www.telerik.com. And by .NET Developers Journal, the world's leading .NET developer magazine. Online at www.sys-con.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Patrick Smakia, lead developer at Endepend. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes. And I'm making an international call today, talking to Patrick Smakia in France. We're talking about software metrics. Patrick is the lead developer uh, at Endepend. Uh, thanks so much, Patrick, for uh, being flexible with me and talking uh, across time zones today. Uh, you're welcome, sir. So I wanted to talk to you about software metrics because uh, I'm a bit of being, a big fan of Endepend and uh, a lot of the different metrics that Endepend provides to uh, measure quality and measure uh, a coupling and all the different things about software that people don't measure. And I knew that you would be the best guy to talk to because I think for a lot of people, lines of code is the metric that they start with and often the metric that they that they end with. Is lines of code a useful metric? Yeah, actually, line of code is a representative code metric because we are we are all working with uh, files, and uh, you can measure the line of code in file. So everybody is thinking in terms of line of code and maybe number of files also. But um, I just would like to make a point here about uh, physical versus logical line of code because if you if you just counting the number of line of code inside your file, which is a lot of a lot of guys I think are doing that. I'm not sure it's a really relevant metric because it can be biased by the language, it can be biased by the code style, the commenting. There is a lot of things uh, coming inside uh, inside this deal. So what what, what the tools are doing, like Endepend or Visual Studio, usually they are co- counting line of code with uh, what we call PDB sequence point. Uh, basically, a sequence point. Every developer, .NET developer, know what is a sequence point. It's when you have a, when you are debugging your code. You just hit F9, okay, to put a breakpoint, and what is underlined by your F9 is a sequence point, okay? And by counting the sequence point, uh, we can say that the sequence point is a line of executable line or executable code, okay? And uh, so we can say that the line of code can be counted with sequence point. I just wanted to make this clear because like this, we have a metric that is uh, language independent, like whether you're doing ZB.NET or C Sharp or F Sharp or, or any other language. You have a metric that can be uh, comparable across language. It's also independent from the code style, and uh, you don't get comment inside the metric also. So it's the perfect metric. It's a logical metric of uh, line of code. Okay, so let me see if I understand this, though. So I want to make sure that I've understood what you said. You're saying that, that when you just count the lines of code, when we do these simple line of code counters that we all have done in you know computer science 101, and the teacher says, we're going to build a program to count lines Sometimes we'll put in simple uh, checks for avoiding things like counting a, um, a curly brace as a line of code. That would be physical lines of code. You're saying that the sequence points. This is based on the the PDB file. This is based on a D on the is the uh-huh. is the PDB file required to count these sequence points? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The, the sequence points are defined inside the PDB, and usually they are they are used by the debugger for the, the debugging experience to link the IL code with the source code, but what most of the .NET tool, whether you are thinking of NDPAN, NCOVER, most of the .NET tool are working actually in sequence points in a way or another, and usually when you are counting the, the number of line of code, you are using the, the sequence points from PDB, and Visual Studio uh-huh. also is counting the... Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Okay, so if you can step over it, then you can count it. Yeah, exactly, yeah, oh, exactly. Okay. Now, in... Uh, in Steve McConnell's book on software estimation, it, he says that lines of code really is an efficient, an efficient way to compare applications, um, but yes, only applications that are developed within the same context. I mean, can I compare an Iron Python application and a C Sharp application with lines of code and get any meaningful result? Yeah, I think that that's uh, that's interesting to use line of code for comparing. 
a lot of dev developers dislike the of code because they, they see it as a yardstick to measure productivity. And uh, I, I don't think it's relevant in, to measure productivity because more line of code, uh, we all know that by copy past code, we can have more line of code and it's a really bad thing. So line of code doesn't measure productivity, but it's still very useful indeed, as Steve McConnell said, uh, to compare code bars. Because, uh, for example, I, I just have a few few numbers here to give. Like the Donate framework with this definition has around 2 million line of code. Okay, like ReSharper have a half a million line of code. And Pen are 80,000. And, and Hibernate has 35,000. Okay, Pen.net has 45,000. And the list is very long. And now you see that with this number, if I'm talking like this, you can say that first, wow, the, the Donate framework is really a big, big, big piece of code. And, and you can compare it to other, 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 other tool or the software that you know. What's interesting is that you can measure your own software and like mm -hmm. compare your effort in your software compared with other effort that you, you think uh, you know about. Ah, I think the thing that surprised me there was that Re, um, ReSharper was a half million lines of code, but uh, that's probably a topic for another day. I'm not working at ReSharper, but I think they have a lot of uh, generated code because uh, you know, it's a comp compiler related and uh, mm -hmm. usually when you develop compiler, you, you generate tons of code. So I, th I think to ReSharper have, uh, have a lot of generated code. But it's also interesting to use line of code inside your code base to compare feature implementation. Okay, like we know that on the feature A, we have like mm -hmm. a 2,000 line of code and feature B, we have 4,000. And then maybe you can assess for the, the future feature C you can assess the number of of code, and maybe you can have a good estimation of the the time you're gonna spend on this feature. Mm -hmm. Now, line of code, though, as a metric, doesn't measure quality; it measures quantity. So it's just one metric of, I assume, several dozen metrics that we might want to use. What are some metrics that I can use to really point at some code, and it tells me whether this is good code or not? Uh, first, line of code can be used for for quality, right? Like. If you have a very big method, usually a method with more than, let's say, 20 line of code, it begins to be really hard to, to understand. Okay. So for, for, for code quality, for maintenance, line of code can be used at the, the method level and I would say even at the type level. But, uh, what's really interesting with line of code is that it's related to, to another very popular metric, which is the ratio of uh, code covered by test. And, uh, whether you are using in the .NET world and cover, or whether you are using uh, Visual Studio for coverage, okay? Mm -hmm. Both the, the, the both tools are, are relying of the, on PDB sequence points actually as line of code. And the, the percentage you get with these tools are actually percentage of line of code. So, so these two metrics are, are pretty related. And, uh, in my opinion, uh, the, the ratio of code covered by test is the most important metric you can have because it's, it doesn't, it's not related really to maintenance. Of course, you can uh, detect a regression test, but it's also relative to correctness, which is very important. Correctness mm -hmm. is really the, the saint graal of uh, every developer. And uh, the more you code is covered, and, and you can be sure, the, 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 the more likely you have a few bugs in it. So the ratio of lines of code covered by tests can tell me whether or not that code is going to run as I expect it to, it, it'll tell me that it's correct. Does it really measure code quality? Uh, I mean, I could write bad code and have great coverage. Um, I guess good yeah. or bad is a usually subjective, like beauty is a subjective thing. Uh, is there a more concrete metric I can use to decide whether code is, is well written or not? Concern to quality, you have some other metrics and uh, more or less we all know about it. So there is one very important metric which is named uh, cyclomatic complexity. So basically the definition is the number of paths a thread can take in a method. So it's a metric defined for method, a concrete method with a body. But uh, more concretely, cyclomatic complexity is the number of uh, for, if, else, switch, case, etc. statement you have in the body of your method. And uh, mm -hmm. indeed, with this metric coupled with the number of line of code, you can have a pretty clear idea of a method that, that won't be maintainable in the future anyway. So you have also another border of this metric, which is the nesting depth, which is the deepest encapsulated scopes inside the body of, a, of the method. Okay. And so you can define this sort, this metric to see really where the, the big fat method 
that that are real, real pain to maintain and to uh, to develop. And uh, of course, you have a lot of guys like number of parameters, number of variables, uh, number of overloads for a method, method etc. So all these metrics, which are the definition is pretty obvious from a developer point of view. All this metric can be used with a tree sold and it's very easy. Uh, you just fix your tree sold like a uh, tree sold applicable in a real world. Like, um, for example, I don't want more than 10 for complexity of a method or more than 20 line of code. And uh, mm -hmm. then in your CI, in your continuous integration process, you, you, you can see immediately, uh, if you have new guys that are, that are, that are pretty bad, not, not respecting this, uh, this tree sold. Okay, so if I have uh, lines of code in my toolbox, I have cyclomatic complexity, and I have uh, the percentage of code covered by test, I can get a good sense of whether or not my code is, uh, is objectively uh, good code. I can tell whether or not it's going to run as I wish. But when I start looking at um, uh, you know, specific functions, and I say this function is too complicated, and I, and I break it up into pieces the complexity of the business problem is still there. I've just made it into, into bite-sized chunks. So I might be able to look at my application and say, this is no longer complex from a method perspective, but the software itself, the way that the software fits together, the way that it couples with other bits of code um, may indicate other problems, don't you think? Yeah, I completely agree with you because actually we are talking we are talking about two kinds of complexity. The the first one you are talking about is relative to your software. It's relative to the domain of your software. And at a point you will reach a point where the the complexity of the software you're developing can, cannot be uh, smaller than what it is now. But by having very big method, very fat tip, uh by having all these very bad things then you are fab fabricating even more complexity. So here, the goal here is to reduce the, co the fabricated complexity to finally just keep the, the essential complexity that you will have anyway, because if you are doing professional software, it is complex anyway. So, so this is, uh, there is really two kinds of complexity and there is one you cannot really uh, reduce, but the other one, there is tool and there are metrics to, to try to reduce this one. I've used Endepend over the years, and we used it at at uh, Carillion Check Free, the banking company that I worked at. And I always found that it took me a while to get my brain around the way that it displays the information. It's a it can be a little overwhelming when you try to present such a large amount of information over a very very large um, uh, project library. I, I I always show people the .NET framework you know, thousands of types, and, we, you know, it, it almost feels like I don't have enough pixels on the screen to to present this. What is the name of the the view that you use to show this? It's kind of like a grid, and then there's colors and um, numbers within the grid, and you can drill in and out. What, what is that called that you're, that you're using? So, basically, what we've done in, uh, in the tool NDPEN is that uh, we have uh, several panels, and say, we, we try to provide several views a new code, whether is it about dependency or whether is it about metrics or, or evolution. But uh, when it comes to metrics, the, the, the view you are talking about is named a tree map. Okay, and basically a tree map is just a view, so it's a rectangle. You have your panel defined as a rectangle, so this rectangle has a width and a height, and it defines a surface. Okay, and the idea is that uh, the, the, the this, this entire surface be split it up with code element metric value. So, for example, if you are lo you, uh, looking at a number of line of code of type uh, inside your library or inside the .NET framework, for example, uh, we can say that like there is like two million line of code. We can say that the surface of the panel is actually two million line of code. And then what we want to, to do is to represent each class inside the .NET framework uh, with the surface prop proportional to the number of line of code of the, the concern class. Okay? So basically, you'll get a rectangle and a lot, a lot of sub-rectangle inside this rectangle. And the, right. the big sub-rectangle will be actually the big type. Hi, it's Scott here from another place in time. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. 
I apologize for interrupting it, but I wanted to let you know that assembling a podcast like this every week isn't free. Certainly the bandwidth bill crushes us every month, so I want to let you know that this show is sponsored by Telerik. They make the show possible, and they make some pretty cool products as well. For example, if you're trying to build a Web 2.0 ajax application, trying to use the Web 1.0 components, it's kind of difficult. you got to get the next-gen stuff if you want to build the next-gen websites, and that's exactly what the folks at Telerik have got in their new upcoming product, which is codenamed Rad Controls Prometheus. It's a big pack of web controls built entirely on top of the Microsoft ASP.NET AJAX stuff that you already understand. It's going to give you a lot of performance and interactivity on your next project. They mirror the ASP.NET AJAX API, so the development's really straightforward. Client scripts are shared. Loading time is pretty fast. You set a couple of properties. You can even bind to web services for a really efficient operation. The new RAD editor for ASP.NET AJAX loads up to four times faster than before. And the RAD grid will do thousands of records in milliseconds. But, of course, it's, it's better to try these things for yourself, so you can visit Telerik.com slash ASP.NET AJAX and download a trial. Thanks a lot for listening, and we'll get right back to the show. Okay, so the size of the rectangle is, an, uh, is something I can choose. I can say that this rectangle is going to be large because of lines of code or because of some other metric. Exactly. So the size of the rectangle is another axis in my, in my graph that I'm, I'm trying to make multi-dimensional data appear in two dimensions. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly that. And what's interesting also with the tree map view is that, uh, is that the, the metric that are the, the, excuse me, the, the class that are related, like for example, classes inside the same namespace w- mm-hmm. will be, uh, will be placed uh, close on the, that will be located uh, near inside the tree map. So you can see that uh, this namespace is big, uh, this uh, assembly is big, or this one is very small. So not only gives you a, a, a size for method type, but also for namespace and assembly. So you can see the, the whole structure of the code base in terms of the metric you have chosen. chosen and here it's the number of line of code. Uh, and then because of the grouping, I can group, the things are grouped by namespace and by assembly. I could look at uh, something kind of I could back away from my large monitor and I could tell whether one assembly is a problem based on the complexity that appears in one assembly versus versus another. I could probably use this also to measure the complexity of open source applications that I bring in, uh, libraries that oh, yeah. may you know may feel good, but when I look at the numbers, uh, they might be trouble in the future. Yeah, well, what is, this is another application of the, this kind of tool for measuring quality. It's good to measure your own quality, but for example, when you are when you are buying a library or when you order someone to do library for you, it's interesting to to have minimal metrics uh, to to abide by inside inside this framework. Like that, you you can be not really sure that the quality will be here, but at least you can you can assess a, a minimal quality. So I think this is a new kind of uh, way to see the relation between. The, uh, the different actor inside the software development, because now you can you can say I, I want this minimum of quality. Like in any other industry, when you are ordering a building or a villa or a house, anything, you want a minimum quality and it's visible with eyes. And uh, with this kind of tool, now you can do it also in software. Right. Yeah. The the ability to be able to stop a build because of something being wrong has always been important to me when I'm doing. Uh, CI, when I'm doing mm. continuous integration, being able to say uh, that the build has failed because of some syntax error is really step zero. Um, being able to stop the build and declare that the build is bad because of a test failure is important. But the idea that you could stop a test based on a design flaw, I always thought was a cool a cool idea that I could say this is just too complex for any human to understand and I'm going to stop the build and you know perhaps I could put in a um an exception yeah but uh, Scott I have a caveat about here here is that uh, mm-hmm. now more and more and uh, we see for upcoming actually and uh, more and more we have a lot of generated code okay and uh, I actually just today I listen you you show with Kathleen Dollars about code generation and mm-hmm. uh, one question was about the quality of generated code and what we can see is that very often the quality of the code generated is not here because this code actually won't have in the future to be understood by uh, by the human. It's not it's not really a good thing. But when tools are analyzing uh, code, at, at first it doesn't make the difference between generated and uh, and a human handcrafted code, right? 
So sure. you, you don't want to maybe to, to, to follow metrics too much about that. So for example, in NDPAN, we are, we are providing some facility, like you can use some uh, regular expression or, or you can require that type outside of this assembly, won't be, mm. won't be inspected or things like that. But still, you have this uh, generated code. Maybe you don't really want to to hear about inside your report. So, so this is a, a good thing to to stop the build, to fail the build because of quality. But uh, you you have to make sure first that uh, you have unlocked this uh, this potential problem. Right. It sounds like I'll have a lot of exceptions. Definitely. Now, lines of code are still these are still pretty pretty basic. We're kind of moving from the, the basic metrics to the more complex. I think that everyone uh, has used lines of code at some point. People, as they start getting into uh, test-driven development and respecting their tests, they start caring about code coverage. The things that I think are the, are the most interesting metrics uh, are the ones that <laughs> I'm afraid use a lot of math and they use a lot of charts and graphs to explain. And the, the one that I found the most useful when I was working in, uh, in, in the banking industry was this notion of afferent and efferent coupling. Afferent AFF yes. and efferent EFF. And I think they're really horribly named because I can't quite keep them, keep them straight. And, uh, the idea is that um, who is using me and what am I using? Is that, is that a fair exactly, way to put yeah. it? And how do I keep them, how do I keep track of which one's afferent coupling and which one's efferent? Yeah, so these two, these two metrics actually, they are related to something very popular for every architect, which is uh, everybody's now these days, nowadays, and this is a good thing. Everybody said, I want low coupling and I want high cohesion inside my code. And what's interesting is that uh, we have metric for that. So metric con concerning coupling, as you said, they are incoming and outgoing or afferent and efferent coupling. Okay. And uh, this metric can be very interesting because, for example, let's take the efferent coupling. What does it mean if you have a high efferent coupling, let's say for a class? A high efferent coupling, it means that you have a class that is using a lot of the class. So efferent coupling means I have a lot of outgoing references. I'm using a lot of stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Imagine you have a class that is using a lot of stuff. Then you can say almost sure that uh, this class is breaking the single responsibility principle. So imagine a class that is using some, uh, some WPF things and it's using also some database things and maybe some uh, threading things, etc. If you are observing a class like this kind of big fat class that is using a lot of things, then you can see that the single responsibility principle that, that just said actually that, that a class should have just one reason to, to change or, or that, uh, that just said that uh, a class have just one concern, you can see that it's, uh, it's broken. And actually, in uh, most of code base I see, there is a lot of uh, such classes. And these classes, they can be spotted with line of code or complexity, but if everyone coupling is an, another good way to, to spot uh, this uh, multi-concern class. And uh, concerning uh, afferent coupling, I mean uh, the, the 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 guy, uh, the number of guy uh, that use me. Imagine that you have a class that is uh, pretty popular, that is pretty used inside your inside your code base. What mm -hmm. does it mean? It, it means that if this class is changing, it will probably broke a lot of other things. So uh, a, a, a high afferent coupling on a class is, uh, I think, it's a bad thing too. And uh, here there is a trick. The trick is to transform your class inside a, uh, as a, you transform your implementation to an abstraction. Okay. If uh, you have a high efferent coupling and in a code base, it's, uh, you cannot uh, avoid it. There will be some type that will be very popular because code base mm -hmm. are made like that. But I think it's a good thing that this, this type will be implementation. Even if, even if you just do one interface for one class, it's a good thing because at least you can agree on a contract. You can define your interface as a contract. And uh, at least you can agree with all these users that uh, they should be that you use this interface this way. Maybe if the implementation evolves, it won't be seen by other uh, by user. So that that's just ah, two usage of this okay. uh, metric that are pretty interesting. And and finally, another usage of afferent coupling. It's interesting because if you have zero, it means that your class is not used at all. And uh, this is not always true because of course you can use it with reflection, you can use it with polymorphism or things like that. But statically, you can see if a class is not used. And, and in NDPEN, we are using this trick to, to pinpoint statically dead code. 
Yeah, that's another uh-huh. usage of uh, interesting usage of uh, afferent coupling. Okay, so afferent coupling, the uh, the incoming usage, uh, mm-hmm. and you're saying that having a lot of people rely on me puts a lot of pressure on me as a class. It also tells me whether exactly. or not I'm going to be a problem if I change. So I like that afferent coupling is a good signal that you should be thinking about interfaces if you haven't already been. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. All right, very cool. Yeah, I just wanted to, there is another little border of this metric, which is the the ranking metric inspired from the Google ranking page algorithm. And uh, in Endipen, we, we implemented this metric so on both type and uh, method, or maybe better said on the graph of type and the graph of method. And so now we can see with this metric which one is very important inside you code. So just as an example, if we apply this metric on the .NET framework, immediately the, the, the top 10 uh, types will, will be object, integer, string, boolean, etc. All mm-hmm. these primitive types that are extremely important and are actually used everywhere. But now if we translate this uh, metric on uh, another code base, it's very interesting because if you don't know a code base, if you're just a beginner of a code base, you just arrive, then you can see what's really important, what really matter inside the code base, and uh, then you can begin to study this thing and see how they are related to, to component, etc. And this is also a, go- a good metric to uh, to, uh, to, to use to, to discover a code base. Yeah. Well, this is one of the things that I think is exciting about software metrics. It, it seems obvious to you, I think, because you work in this uh, in this stuff every day. But the idea that you could come upon a, a a metric, which is really just an equation, and you could say, "Oh, well, this would be fun. Let's see how we can apply this to to code." So the idea that you took Google Page Rank as a as a popularity. And applied it to code is, I think, a, is is, a, is a way I wouldn't have thought a thing I wouldn't have thought of. Yeah, this gives pretty interesting. I'm not sure I'm the first one that, that did that, but uh, uh, that that gives pretty interesting results. Well, certainly, there, n- no one's the first one to do anything anymore. No, I know that Pedli de Halle, like now, uh, which is now at Microsoft Research on on the PEX. I know he did this metric. I think a bit before me, he did this metric inside uh, inside .NET Reflector. I think, but, but still. Ah, yeah. One of the metrics that stood out that I thought was fun was this metric called CRAP, the CRAP metric, which stands for Change Risk Analyzer and Predictor. It's a it's a Java metric that uh, basically tells you if your code is crap, right? Yeah. The problem, so here we have some other metrics, like uh, that. actually there are metric composition. So now, so far, we just talk about basic metrics that can be really inferred immediately from the code base. And the idea here is to put some equation and to compose this metric. So, for example, the crap is the cyclomatic uh, complexity uh, squared, uh, multiply by one minus the coverage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have a, a, a big formula, and at the end, an expert say you that the value given by this formula, uh, in this range it will be very bad, in this range it will be acceptable, etc. So you can use metric, you can compose metric. There is another example of uh, metric composition in Visual Studio. Uh, you have the maintainability index, okay, which is a mix of the Halstead me- volumetric mm-hmm. metric and cyclomatic complexity, line of code, etc. And the idea is that here you get a number without dimension, okay? When you say uh, line of code, the dimension here is, is one line of code, right? Or when you say afferent coupling, the dimension is the is the number of users. Okay, mm-hmm. but here you get a, a metric without dimension that is supposed to give you a, a result about what's really bad. And my opinion, I don't really believe in this metric because I, I've never seen a, a killer composed metric uh, because it's very easy to to fake this metric with a false positive and a counter example than uh, that 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 show that it doesn't work all the time. I think that the, the definition of a software metric has to has to stay pretty uh, pretty understandable for everybody, and the, mm-hmm. the minimal requirement is that you can understand the dimension of the metric. Well, the the thing that I like about this metric and why I think the crap metric is is fun, and and not just fun but useful, is that it, in this instance where we're composing a metric about complexity, we're composing a metric using cyclomatic complexity. And composing it with coverage, we're basically saying that this is complex, but I'm protected by these tests. 
I think you can have a more linear way to compose metrics. So, for example, the approach we are taking in NDPEN is that you can just define some rule and uh, you can ask, for example, for complex methods that are not covered because you can define some kind of uh, what we call SQL query. So basically, we are querying the code as you would query a database, okay? Mm -hmm. And maybe you can really ask a select method where the complexity is higher than maybe 10 and uh, the percentage coverage is lower maybe than 10%. And you get the effectively the same thing is what you're saying. Exactly, but it's more linear and at least it remains understandable. And, and if you have a, a false positive, it will be very easy to understand why why uh, here you have a problem. But usually by, by composing linearly the metric, it's very, you can uh, understand the result, which is really the, the most understand thing, uh, and the important thing. Yeah, that's a good point. The, the crap metric is interesting because it squares the complexity number and then it cubes the code coverage number so it's putting more uh weight on on one aspect of the of the the metric than another as with all of these things they have a reason for it but i think your your point is well taken you can't really easily look at the value and say here's what i need to do to pass this metric mm -hmm. another composed metric that you use is this this vs maintainability uh index mm -hmm. this is something that the fx cop team uses it's an index uh, that's that's more linear, but it, it, it is it a, it's not a percentage, right? It's not one to a hundred, is it? I don't quite understand the number. Because that, that's exactly the point I was uh, I was making. You, you don't get the number because there is no dimension in that number because it's a mix between several metrics like complexity, line of code, mm -hmm. uh, etc. And, and so you cannot put a dimension. And if you don't understand, Microsoft just told you tell you that you will have a, a number between uh, zero and one hundred. But mm -hmm. uh, and maybe if uh, if it's uh, up to twenty, it will be good. But uh, you just just force to to uh, to listen to them because you should not an expert. You cannot understand the dimension of this metric, and and you cannot do proper choice by your own. So the, this is the world problem with the composing not non linearly metrics. I think. Yeah, I I agree. It's very confusing. Now I've been playing with .NET four zero, and I know that you have too, and you've been looking at. Uh, evol I think you call them evolutionary metrics or metrics around how, how things change. So being able to compare multiple builds. And, uh, you had a blog post a couple of days ago where you were looking at .NET 3.5 and .NET 4 and seeing, uh, what was changed and, uh, and what was added to, uh, the .NET framework. Yeah, I think that the change, the evolution, the changes inside the code base is mm -hmm. extremely important. And whether, whether you are using the framework Work, like the .NET framework and want to see what, what's evolving or whether you are just uh, seeing the evolution on your own code, I think it's very important because think about it, when you release the, some code, when the code is uh, in production, okay, if you have a, if you, usually you don't have bugs or you have a few bugs when the code is in production or, or at least this is the, the, the goal you want to, to achieve, right? So between the release uh, N minus one and the, and the next release uh, number N, Okay, all the all the difference between the the two uh, the two snapshots of code base can contain potential bugs that are, have not been in, have not been in production yet. So I think that uh, focusing on two the delta between two releases is extremely important. And and uh, in my opinion, the very few uh, development team are, are using this uh, this powerful feature, which can be used actually in Independ. We we can you can couple this uh, feature. With, for example, quality metrics. So, for example, you can you can write some rule and just ask for, tell me about methods that have been uh, added or maybe refactored. Okay, the way the code was changed, right? Mm -hmm. And I want to know about th this method, and uh, I want to make sure that all these methods have uh, maybe uh, ninety percent coverage by test or even one hundred percent. So, or maybe you can require that this, this method are, are, may, are maybe like uh, a complexity uh, lower than ten. So what is really cool here is that uh, everybody is dealing with legacy. Suppose now you are dealing with a very huge code base. Right. And you can say, from now, all the refactored method, all the added method, I want them to uh, to respect a minimum quality. This is, uh, from my perspective, this is the best uh, feature of the of the product this, to allow you to 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 to, to focus on onto the changes. And to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to some rules to, uh, to make the quality better on the changes because, because now we know that the code gets refactored 
And uh, we know that in one year, in two years, in three years, a legacy code base will be more or less transformed totally. So, so if you if you focus on delta after delta on the quality, whether you are talking about coverage or cyclomactic complexity, etc., if you focus on quality just on the delta, you don't need to say like from now we're going to stop everything for three months and uh, refactor everything to a bad quality metric. Here, the interesting thing is that just the delta we are producing now since the last release, we want to focus the quality on this one. And and if you apply this uh, very simple principle, maybe in one year, in two years, in each year, you will get uh, a, a good code base. All right. I, I agree. I think that over, over time, being able to set a bar and make sure that you don't regress, that you don't go back in time to a, uh, a, a time that was the, the quality of your code was, was, was lesser, I think is very important. So the, the, mm-hmm. the product that, you, that you're selling is called Endepend, and people can see that at endepend.com. And you blog mm-hmm. uh, about software metrics at codebetter.com, and uh, people can find your blog up mm-hmm. there. And I'll put links to all of this in the, uh, in the show notes. I really appreciate you taking okay, the uh, the time to come and chat with me on the show today, Patrick. Okay, you're welcome, Scott. I appreciate you too. All right. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'll see you again next week. Mm-hmm.